this is Johanna Medergaard. She is she studied in Oxford, something Cox's related, <laughs> something with the metacognition, philosophy, and all sorts of stuff. And now she's here doing a PhD. Uh, the linguists say she's a Cox's, and most Cox's say she's a linguist. That's also why it's nice to have her here because it means she has a background slightly different from ours. Uh, we spoke with this first time when we talked about Chomsky, and I said, "Oh yeah, I think they teach us that he's the guy no one believes in anymore." And she got really angry, and now she's doing a cock talk <laughs> about why he turns out Best motivation for any cock talk. Exactly. Yeah. So welcome to your hand, and let's have a nice talk. Cool. Right. So I wouldn't say I'm a hardcore Chomskyan. <laughs> I was just brought up in that uh, tradition, which they strangely still teach at Oxford. Um, but I just think since he is one of the founding fathers of cognitive, of cognitive science, regardless of what, what Christian Mitterlin will tell you, um, it's important to understand what he actually said and why it's not always as stupid as people say this. Also, people in the English faculty over here still believe everything he says. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about his kind of general ideas about what it means to have a theory of language and um, some of the core concepts. So what does he mean by syntax, poverty of the stimulus, universal grammar, um, the difference between competence and performance, and all that stuff. And I will be, it's going to be a kind of whirlwind tour. I'm going to try to cover more than 60 years of research in <laughs> 45 minutes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so if um, there are things that don't make sense, uh, that you don't understand, or I'm using words that you don't know, uh, just stop me and ask. Um, yeah, so let's go. What do you think when you see this man? I also have a lot of cute pictures of Tom Chomsky in this presentation. <laughs> what have you already been told about him, or what do you know? What do we associate with him? It's interactive. Um, yeah, he kind of had a theory, and then when he was proved wrong, he kind of just like edited the theory, so he kind of put the findings and stuff like that. So he's kind of like a bit shady. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Times. Yeah. Actually, most people in political theory don't know that he's a linguist as well. <laughs> and the other way around. But he's like a world renowned scholar in both of these fields, which is also a reason why you should respect him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> huh? Huh? Oh, yeah. Yes. 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 So he's very famous for his theory that language is innate which is what most people disagree strongly with. Right, kind of on a related note, he thinks that uh, language is way more important for cognition than it probably is. Yeah. That was kind of, um, that was a really important contribution, actually, in the 1950s, but we'll get to that in a second. Right. So that's fun. Um, I think he has a lot of very beautiful ideas and he writes very convincingly. You're always reading his things and you're like, yes, you're completely right. Um, and then you think about it for a bit and you're like, wait, you have no empirical evidence. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So for example, this I think is a nice quote. Language is a process of free creation. Its laws and principles are fixed, but the manner in which the principles of generation are used is free and infinitely varied. Even the interpretation and use of words involves a process of recreation. So he wanted to explain how language makes infinite use of finite means. And that was his, that's what he thought was incredible about language. We have this set of structures and a set of words, and then we can express any sentence or any new idea, even ones that have never been expressed before. And we can also understand sentences we've never heard before. Famously, uh, what is it? Call the screen ideas sleep curiously. We recognize as a well formed sentence, but it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, so, at the very beginning, um, in 19, 
59. Joshki, who is still alive, <laughs> um, <laughs> wrote a very scathing review of B.F. Skinner's verbal behavior. B.F. Skinner was a very famous behaviorist who had done a lot of experiments on rats and pigeons. And then he thought, I have a theory of human language now. And he wrote a book about it, um, explaining language in terms of stimulus and response patterns. And back then, behaviorism was the shit. So they were just like, whatever goes on in the mind, we can't know. So we won't say anything about that. We can only know what goes in and what comes out. So he tried to explain language like this, and Chomsky was not pleased. <laughs> I have some... Uh, Golden quotes from this review. Um, so here he quotes Skinner, who writes, if we are shown a prize work of art and exclaim, beautiful, the speed and energy of the response will not be lost on the owner. And then Chomsky says, basically, why would you expect someone to say beautiful in a louder and more high-pitched way the more beautiful something is? <laughs> so if you see something really beautiful, you go, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> And that, that's the kind of very simple stimulus response mapping that Chomsky says Skinner believes in. Obviously, he's also very mean to Skinner. <laughs> he was not quite this stupid. But <laughs> um, yeah, as he says, it may be equally effective to look at the picture silently, long delay, and then murmur beautiful in a soft, low pitched voice. By definition, very low response strength. Um, this was basically the start of the cognitive revolution. It was all great. Um, here's also, also this quote, um, adds a bit more nuance to what we usually think Chomsky thinks. So usually we would say he um, doesn't really believe in statistical learning or whatever. You can't learn language from the environment or from, from stimuli. But he actually says here that the remarkable capacity of the child to generalize, hypothesize, and process information in a variety of very special and apparently highly complex ways, which we cannot yet describe or begin to understand, um, that's also really important. So he has always said there are some things that are innate, and there are some things that we get from the environment. And the job of the linguist is kind of to delineate the things that are innate to all humans. He never said most of it is innate, or most of it comes from the environment. And then the last one here, um, this follows on from something Skinner said about how you can only respond to things from past experience. So he says, it would appear to follow from this description that a speaker will not respond properly to the command, your money or your life, unless he has a past history of being killed. <laughs> yeah. This entire review is amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's how it all started. And then in cognitive science, um, they kind of turned the whole cognitive science program inward a bit more. And they were like, oh, maybe the human mind is an information processing machine. And maybe we should try to characterize the rules um, by which we convert input to output instead of just describing what comes in and what comes out. Um, so for Chomsky, this, a theory of language should be observationally adequate, which means uh, it should be able to enumerate all of these points. This is kind of uh, analogous to overfitting. So you, you just describe everything you see, but you have no system to it. Um, and an even better theory should be descriptively adequate. This is why you have rules um, that explain the data. So generalizations about language, what regularizations about language. So the plural rule, plural rule in English, for example, if it's observationally adequate, we just say horses means plural horse, ducks means plural duck, etc. We just have all the plural forms. But if it's descriptive deck adequate, you have a rule that says add S or add ES. Um, and then the last and best level is explanatorily adequate, um, which means that we should be able to explain why language is the way it is and not in any other way. So this is where the whole uh, innate language comes in. 
So he wants to explain what it is that all humans are born with that mean that uh, all languages have similar structures and that's universal grammar. Um, the kind of research program that tries to find all these universal structures. Uh, also, another idea that I think is very cool is that syntax and language in general is supposed to be like a window into the human mind. So if we can characterize the representations that language gives us for cognition, um, we can understand how humans are information processing machines. Um, yes, very brief history of generative linguistics. I won't go into all of this. As you said, um, there has been many different iterations of uh, generative linguistics, also because it's a 60 year research program. Um, but a theory of universal grammar must meet two conditions. It must be compatible with all languages and it must be sufficiently constrained to allow for grammar to develop in the mind with limited evidence. And this whole limited evidence is really the most contested point of all this, but we'll get back to that. So there's been all these different iterations, standard theory, extended standard theory, revised extended standard <laughs> theory, <laughs> relational grammar, government and binding of principles and parameters. That's the one I know best. And then more recently, we have the Minibus program, which is incredibly what a lot of linguists still do research in. Um, basically, they just added more and more and more rules and more and more complexities. And then the Minibus program is kind of like, okay, we'll get rid of all of that complexity. Now there's only two rules left. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll get back to what those two are as well. Um, yes, so syntax. Shevsky says there are many things you can't explain without reference to underlying structure. So you can't, language is not just a linear progression. For example, how does the man is happy become, is the man happy? You have to move the verb to the front. Um, so we would also expect if we formed a rule about this, we would say, take the first verb, move it to the front, now it's a question. But that doesn't work with how does the man, well, the man who is tall is happy. If we just moved the first verb to the front, that would be, is the man who tall is happy? <laughs> Which is not a well-formed English sentence, in case you didn't know. <laughs> um, so we, have, we need something to explain that it's not actually that is, it's the, it's the is of the main clause that needs to get to the front. So is the man who is tall happy? There is some hierarchical structure here. Um, sentences embedded within other sentences, and that's a really important part of um, theoretical linguistics. Things move around, and things are in hierarchies. Also, Agnes is easy to please, and Agnes is eager to please. These are very uh, structurally similar, but in terms of meaning, they're very different. So. Agnes is easy to please means it's easy to please Agnes. Agnes is eager to please means Agnes is eager to please someone else. So these are the kind of things that Chomsky says we can't explain this without reference to deeper structures. The same with um, why are flying planes can be dangerous. What are the what are the two interpretations of that? Peter? That to fly can be dangerous and planes that are flying. Yeah, <laughs> and I saw the man with the telescope. Why is that ambiguous? Yeah. I will see a man with a telescope, a man with walking with a telescope. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, a colleague of ours um, <laughs> introduced the third interpretation of the sentence, mm -hmm. and she said that it's possible that someone is sewing. <laughs> <laughs> In that case, you have three years, and therefore you either saw something using someone using it, or you, or you, yes, or, or you saw someone using it. Incredible. 
<laughs> so this is also a really nice diagram, I think. Um, so basically, Chomsky works with competence and performance. Competence is the kind of system in your mind that generates well-formed sentences, and performance is whatever you spew out <laughs> in terms of language, which might be or well, you're constrained in terms of memory and attention and all these things. So everything you can generate or understand in your head is not everything that's out there because we have other constraints. Um, yeah. So basically, this is what we the evidence we have. This is what the evidence we could have. And then, ah, yes. We need a theory of language that explains only some of it and not all of it. Shouldn't overgeneralize. I have a question about that. Yeah. So the performance, did I understand right correctly that that's all the stuff that we do say, but it's not well formed language or whatever? Well, what's the exclusion there? Yeah, it's uh, stuff that's not generated by the I language, by your <laughs> mind. Well, we say. So, like, let's say gestures yeah. is part of the language system, whatever. Yeah, I know this is different. I don't think. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you would say they were. But so what kind we, of stuff is it? Grammatically uh, ill-formed sentences. Okay, that we still say. Yeah. Like when we say half a sentence and stuff, yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah. Okay. yeah, exactly. So those are not considered part of the language. No. Then, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Confirmation. Because I, yeah. Yeah. Well, they're not. Yeah. He. He wants to study the ideal speaker here in a homogenous speech community. <laughs> <laughs> everyone speaks exactly the same, and everyone, nobody ever makes mistakes. Yeah, yeah right? It's, it really exists out there in the real world. <laughs> Did you have a question? Yeah, I just also like to say an example. So, being a speaker, doing a talk, is, I, I think, like, I have this experience that I have something to say. And then I get confused with all the words and use the wrong instead of the better fitting one. So I can totally see this difference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so is there a defense to this attack or whatever? Like what's, because this just seems like, well, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm trying to think what Chomsky would say. <laughs> All well, I mean, performance is, he has written a lot about why performance is not interesting okay. as a linguist to study. Um, because he wants to say this, all the errors we make are just kind of random and they have to do with other things than the language system, which he says that there is a language system, <laughs> which is also something you could argue about. Um, so he says, all the Things in performance, all the mistakes we make when we trail off, when we produce, when we can't understand a well-formed sentence because it's too long, um, all of that is uninteresting because it has to do with attention and memory and other resources. Yeah? Well, isn't that um, because there's also systems in the errors? Um, a lot of new language comes so, there's these slangs or pigeon languages and stuff like that comes from, yeah, errors that are systematic. Yeah, but, um, so pigeons only become interesting when they become creoles, according to Chapsky, then, because until then they're just random. He doesn't care about sociolinguistics, <laughs> which is very weird from him, but that's the way he is. He only cares about the cognitive Arts and language, which have nothing to do with the real world or other people. And also, not <laughs> it does make sense that if your language is and how your language is in your mind, you don't care if, it's, if you can't say it, probably because you're interrupted. Yeah. Or can't remember. Yeah. That's someone else's view. Yeah. Okay. So, moving yeah. on. <laughs> See? Becoming a church kid. Ah, yes. So there's a bit more than sex. Um, as you can see, originally it was kind of there was deep structure 
and then it becomes separate structure via some transformations. All of this early Jefferson linguistics is also very inspired by um, mathematics um, and sets and a lot of stuff. So here we can see um, the sentences in, in nine have the same deep structure. I expect it, especially this will examine John, but the sentences in eight have different deep structures. Yeah, we'll get into this. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like what you wanted to say is the same thing. Yeah. And it came out in different ways. But yeah. And it, even though they look like they have the same surface structures, like eight. I and nine I look like they have the same surface structure, but they don't actually, uh, they can't be passivized and still have the same structure. Anyway, as a lot of, uh, yeah, general, general linguistics is very, can get very technical very fast. So basically, this is why he's angry with behaviorism, because he says there's no kind of mapping from the inner structure of the message you want to get across and the surface structure. You just have, you just get an input and then something happens and you produce an output. And there's not really any rules about how you um, transform the grammatical relations you have in your head to words that come out. How language can be so creative and productive as it is. So this is kind of a modern syntax. In Denmark, at least, uh, functionalism is very popular instead of generalism, where we say, okay, languages have similar structures, but that's because of uh, the demands of our surroundings. We need to like, convey information quite fast and in a relatively unambiguous way, blah, blah, blah. And instead of languages have the same structures because we are the same in our brains. To what extent these two ideas are different with respect to uh, the evolutionarism of the form of the function itself? Like, does it, like, how can you tell that there's no structural difference uh, if you don't know that the structural difference could also be influenced by the common demand of our <laughs> so, I'm not sure. Uh, if you're saying that uh, if the functionalism idea is that the language has more structures not because of our mind but because of the common demands of our surroundings, yeah. how can you say that our minds are not similar because of the common demands of our surroundings? Oh, you can. That's also a whole like what came first <laughs> uh, kind of <laughs> discussion. That's just a matter of ideological standpoint, I think, <laughs> at this point. Well, all of the current languages stem from greater languages as well as also trace back from, like, we have, we have gaming and groups and features over time and languages come to form. So that's fair. However, I think Charles is very interested in the self rules and uh, I languages as well. Yeah. Okay. It's interesting that he declines to feel that he needs to, like, to study like the ideal speaker and at the same time he says that like it evolves, so the language evolves because of like environmental demands. No, he doesn't but, think that functionalism is oh, not Chomsky. No. Okay. Sorry, that wasn't true. These are different branches okay. of syntax now. <laughs> <laughs> But as I said before, in minimalism, everything has been stripped away apart from move alpha and merge. These are the only two rules that are left. <laughs> move alpha means move anything anywhere. <laughs> and merge is put two things together and they become one thing. <laughs> like what? Like, like, um, um, drink and water are two separate words, but if you put them together, they make a verb phrase, drink water. And that can be put in the same positions as just drink, usually. So there's a head of that 
race, which is great. Yeah. And move move alpha is not as silly as I just made it sound, <laughs> um, because we they kind of shifted the focus from having rules about where things move around in syntax, like uh, the is man who is told is happy example, um, to kind of we have you can move a constituent that is a word or many words that belong together anywhere, but there are a lot of constraints and our uh, job is to characterize these constraints. How that's different from rules, I'll let you um, think about this. <laughs> it's still this idea in, in this branch of view or whatever that um, this set of rules about language, that's a more efficient way maybe or a precise way of describing ways to manipulate language. Does this also map onto cognition? Um, yes, I think. Okay. Um, I they're very, especially in merge, I think they're very like, this is a key component of human cognition. We can put things together and treat them as whole new things. <laughs> and it's hierarchical as well. Yeah. And then everything apart from those two things. Yeah. Is something bigger. Yeah. But those are the yes. Yeah. And um, you have, so in the old kind of principles and parameters version, you have principles, which are what these would be. We have merge, we have hierarchical structure, and then parameters is all the ways that languages differ. And you have kind of like a switch in your head that says, okay, this language has, in this language you can drop subjects and it's still recognizable. Um, so as soon as you are exposed to some input, you think, oh, right, I'm in this kind of language now. Um, but but the switches are innate. <laughs> yes, this is the setting of the switch that you get from the input. Yes, this is what a syntactic tree looks like in minimal syntax now. Wow. I just have a question: so The languages have similar structures. Yes. For example, like a language like Mandarin, where they just they don't really, as far as I know, they're very different from Danish or like English. So like how does that like how do we argue? You said something about parameters, but how do you argue that Mandarin who might not like I think they don't use like pronoun, like they don't use tempus, like they don't use time. So mm -hmm. they just say I eat yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I just don't know how that fits. Like how would you argue that that's similar to anything? Yeah. Um they still have merged. <laughs> they still have merged. Yeah. Like so so okay. I guess that's the point that you have some very general things that okay. all languages have. And yes, parameters were different. But it's a huge problem for generative linguistics that they focus so much on English. Okay. And like way like I don't even know how large a majority of everything all the work that's been done has been done in English. And it doesn't generalize well. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, to things like Mandarin or Greenlandic, which I have done some research on. But that's for a different talk. <laughs> um yeah. They a lot of the time, they just take themselves, like one English-speaking linguist, as the evidence. <laughs> because they're like, I need one ideal speaker here. That's me. <laughs> 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 and then they just think, like, is this a grammatical sentence? No. Is this a grammatical sentence? Yes. <laughs> there must be a rule there somewhere. Yeah. So, but yes, okay. things like move, alpha, and merge, or you can also find in Greenlandic and Chinese, or Mandarin. So it's the job of generative linguists to find these things that you can actually find in all languages, including sign languages, for that matter. So how do they look at these rules? Is it that if a sentence is right, or whether what sentence you can generate? So is it I can combine things and get a sentence, yeah. and this sentence is right, yeah. or is it I have a sentence and it is combined from this? So is it like bottom up or top down? Um, they they judge it by whether the sentence is grammatical or not if it's right or not, which is also problematic. <laughs> because as we talked about before, languages change, so things that might not have been grammatical before are now. <laughs> and that's not really <laughs> something we take into account all the time. Yeah? I don't get why uh, people use uh, sign language as evidence uh, anyway, because they're formed by, so the effects of my home sign language are formed by parents who yeah. can hear. Uh, yeah, but, but home sign is like pigeons. But also organized sign language. 
just as well. But they I have a guided by spoken languages to begin with. The real sign languages also have structure. Yeah, hierarchical exactly, structure. But, and they also like guided by the written language. Uh, like, not necessarily that they mirror it, but they can pick, they know about all the concepts to begin with. There's someone shaking his head. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, as a of fact, it doesn't look like that. Uh, it's the, the most popular example, I think, is the one of Australia. I think, correct me if I'm wrong. Nicaragua? Uh, the, the, the popular so. example is the Australian Sign Language, the one where uh, there was no no no. There was no sign in school. Yeah, that's the Nicaraguan sign language. Yeah, the yeah. home so in Nicaragua so where they uh, collected I mean, deaf children and then yes. suddenly. Poof. However, it was not imposed from above. The actual sign language is still developed by people who spoke it. Yeah, well, but I guess it was also developed by parents who could hear and speak. But it wasn't so developed by the parents. Well, no, no, but then with collaboration, so they can bring it. But that's the same discussion with Creoles, right? They also have elements from the languages that they are made up of. Yeah. But they have um, a lot of structure and rules that don't necessarily come from the parent languages. And it's the same with sign languages. So you have some elements from um, the spoken languages or the written languages or the home sign, but you can't explain all the structure that emerges in those but just from the bits and pieces of the other ones. No, but if you look for evidence that all languages have these features, and then then if you go look for sign languages, that of course of course they can keep the features from languages of this, uh, of the sign language because we also speak and speak can communicate with the language. Maybe I'll say that there will also be time for discussion. Yeah or yeah if it's longer discussions about the specific yeah. Shall we? Do you have a question, Raka, or should we? It's just a comment back to the switch hypothesis. So um, I feel that in that case, mother tongue is a special case, kind of. I I feel like at least based on my experiences, like Hungarian is quite different from English and German and Danish other languages I know. But I don't experience this. Okay, now I, I'm talking on this. Like maybe I experience it like between switching between like in English, German, and Danish. But when I switch back to my mother tongue, I don't experience this. Okay, so these are now the rules. No. I want to like. But you have very clear intuitions about when it's wrong, right? Yeah. Like, is the man whose hole is happy? It's a very clear feeling that that's wrong, and uh, that's what you have in your native language usually. Okay. Okay, and so that's, the, that's right. the main evidence that general okay. linguists use intuition, yeah. grammatical intuition. Okay. So it's not necessarily like an explicit. No, 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 no. Okay. No, no, no. It's never been explicit rules that you know, in like, and you can put into words. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and which is why linguists shouldn't use themselves as subjects. <laughs> um. Okay. We're gonna. Did you say we had we had fifteen minutes left? Okay. So, <laughs> poverty of the stimulus uh, is a reference to Chomsky's argument that we can't learn full language with the poor evidence that we get when we are children, babies. Um, and back in 1981, Jerry Foto, who we might also be familiar with, um, was very excited about the poverty of the stimulus argument. It is the existence proof for the possibility of a cognitive science. <laughs> <laughs> and it is quite possibly the only important result in the field today. <laughs> yeah. Photo, <laughs> who is also controversial now. But um, yeah. Chomsky says the primary linguistic data are insufficient because um, you can never, it's just a small sample of all the sentences that you could have put here. And you don't reliably hear sentences that falsify the hypotheses you would form about how what's grammatical in the language. So again, he didn't really uh, cite any empirical evidence for this. He just said they never hear the kind of sentences that they need to falsify the hypotheses. Um, and then obviously someone else tried to figure out 
uh, <laughs> whether they did. So this all rests on the idea that you don't get the right kind of input to infer linguistic structure. So it must all be already be in the brain. So Pollum and Schultz famously tried to actually look in databases of child-directed language to see if they could find evidence that you would need to falsify a hypothesis about what's grammatical or not. So, for example, Chomsky said, children learn the order of it may have been raining, so of which order do we put these modal verbs in without seeing enough examples? And they look at the data and they see, oh, look, there's all these examples <laughs> that you could use to generalize this rule. And again, anaphoric one. So James has a blue bike, but Anna doesn't have one. Is a correct sentence. But James has a blue bike, but Anna doesn't have a green. Not a correct sentence. Um, and that's because of the constituent structure. But she actually said you can't, you can't infer the, that that's the kind of hierarchical structure we have we have in this case without you never see examples of James has a blue bike, but Anna doesn't have a green. So you could never understand that that would be a wrong sentence. But again, they find examples where you could infer this. And finally, as we talked about before, is the man who is sitting in the corner happy? Again, auxiliary fronting. There are examples of this. So as soon as you start to actually look, and this, Daisy said that they looked through in 2002, was not that big. So if you actually look through some of the databases you have now, you would find way more examples. Ah, universal grammar. <laughs> Whenever universal grammar is criticized, or people find something in X language that is not included in universal grammar, um, generative linguists just tend to say, well, okay, we'll expand universal grammar then. <laughs> <laughs> to include this thing. So with Mandarin, for example, if they found, oh, there is no tense in Mandarin, I guess universal grammar, I guess that's a uh, parameter and not a principle. <laughs> it can be there, it can be there. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so that's nice. And that means it's not a theory, it's a framework. It's a research framework. Just like <laughs> yeah. So I guess it means we we'll look for the things that are in common and that are different. Yeah. And that's not a stupid no. research. No. Exactly. Where people object to it is where they say, and this means that it's innate. Yeah. Yeah. So this is an example of a creole, Haitian creole, um, and you might be able to read some of it. Here it says vehicle, for example. It's a nice English word that we know. Um, yeah. Are people coming from one language? Yes, maybe I should explain what pigeons and creoles are. <laughs> a pigeon is a kind of mix between different languages that are used, pigeons are usually used in trade situations around the world. And it's very like rudimentary. It's not a full language. It doesn't have full grammar or anything. It's just like all communication and it's kind of. Uh, and then when the pigeon speakers have children, they form creoles, which are kind of like the baby languages of pigeons, but they are fully grown languages. So wherever there are grammatical things missing from the pigeons, the children fill it in, which people cite as evidence for universal grammar as well. So like, oh, they didn't get these structures from anywhere. They must have been in their brains all along. When Chomsky says that uh, is made, does he then refer to any genes or specific neurons besides like birds and monkeys that has to do with that? Or does he just say that it's, it is innate and not where in the brain or in the body it is or no. that it might be? No, he doesn't have any theories about where exactly it might be. He would say that that's not his job. <laughs> yeah. Well, there are. He has to, you know, delineate his job somewhere. 
Probably somebody, right? Yeah. But it's the same with language evolution. When people ask him, like, how do you think language evolved? He's also like, I don't know. Maybe it was a mutation sometime. <laughs> yeah. Marriage is all, yeah. Um, yes. So this relation between pigeons and creoles is something people cite a lot. I don't know if you know this guy. His name is Dan Everett. And he has uh, been a major, played a major role in uh, like shedding doubt to, on universal grammar. Because one of the most important things is uh, this hierarchical structure of recursion. So where you can actually embed a sentence in another sentence. And that was like the cornerstone of universal grammar. But then he found this tribe in the Amazon who reportedly didn't have recursion. So they don't embed things in other things. They don't have hierarchical structure, allegedly. He was a missionary. Um, and then he became a linguist. And since then, <laughs> uh, the, the Brazilian government hasn't let anyone go and interview this tribe. <laughs> because all of the linguists all obviously wanted to go and interview them. So we only have his word for it. But still, it was a very influential word. Yes. Piraha, it's called this language. Um, it's also some languages in Australia that don't have move alpha, maybe. Some of the indigenous languages. So it's also maybe counter evidence. But again, we could just add a parameter. Maybe there's a recursion parameter or move alpha parameter. Some people call this continual refinement, others call it unfalsifiable. <laughs> <laughs> so now we return to confidence and performance. We already talked a bit about this, what's more important to study. Back in the 50s and 60s and 70s, Chomsky and Bill Above, who you will like much more than Chomsky, um, had a lot of debate about this. Ms. Above was kind of the first real social linguist who described how uh, people use language and the way they use language kind of if you describe that you also describe kind of between group dynamics and how people use a certain language to belong to a specific group etc so basically Labov thinks between people dynamics is more important Chomsky thinks within people dynamics is more important and they just kind of they will never agree on this politically they agree but that's, yeah, the idea of speaking here and the idea of speech community. This is basically what we talked about before. Language as communication is not interesting. <laughs> that's just kind of an auxiliary function of language. It's not the primary thing. That, yeah, I know. <laughs> it's not the primary thing we use it for. It's primarily for cognition. And then... Fortunately, we can also sometimes use it for communication. <laughs> I guess it would be a bit like saying, I'm not so interested in movement as I am in how the brain decides how to make movement. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, that is and it doesn't matter if you're like in a box standing like this, you can't move, then you can't say. But I still have yeah. the functionality to do it, and that's what I care about. Yeah. Maybe okay, we should just find a different word in language to describe this thing. I guess he would say we have a different word for studying what goes on outside, which is communication. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. Someone who knows its language perfectly and is unaffected by such grammatically irrelevant conditions as memory limitations, distractions, shift of attention and interest, and errors. Random or characteristic in applying his knowledge of the language in actual performance. <laughs> None of this matters. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Bill Above, who is also still alive. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> oh, yes. The end. <laughs> now that you've all been converted to Chomskyan. <laughs> no, I hope you. Uh, have a bit more of a fuller picture of what he's actually trying to say and why and where he comes from. Um, because I would like to end by saying that he was 
one of the founding fathers of cognitive science. And uh, it's really important to understand what he actually gave us. So thinking about language as a cognitive phenomenon and generally thinking about anything as a cognitive phenomenon and not just as behavior out there in the world. This kind of comes from him. Um, what does it mean to explain something in cognitive science? We have these levels of explanation. We can, we can just describe all of the data points or we can have rules that describe the data points or we can say, why are these rules the way they are? And that would be the best kind of explanation. That applies to different other things in language as well. What's the proper object of studying linguistics? It's a, an ongoing fight. <laughs> Linguists are very, um, <laughs> they like combat. <laughs> um, and how it, we kind of got rid of behaviorism back in the day, then it came back for a bit, now it's going again. You know, you know how this things <laughs> move forward and backwards in science. Yes, I think that's it. Yes. It is now four o'clock, so let's give you a hand. There will be time for questions for a few months. Thank you. So it's four o'clock. If anyone wants to speak, they can go. I'm still not quite convinced. Why would you study, like, what, what is the kind of main argument for studying language instead of, like, as an special thing, instead of as, like, a general cognitive phenomenon, like, is, say, studying pattern recognition, how that's the kind of way language instead of science, but studying language is a special thing that creates everything else. <laughs> um, that's a good question. I don't think... Uh, I don't think actually there would be a good argument for treating language as a special thing, but then, yeah, then I, it's like kind of the most accessible thing that has all these interesting problems. I get why we do it as linguists because otherwise we wouldn't have a job. <laughs> but not for uh, but you want to actually try to do science. <laughs> <laughs> I think some people say, look at language. It's so we're making infinite use of finite things, it's so creative, it's so productive. How um, we have no examples of other things that that have no examples of other things that are so accessible. We can just ask people about them, and they don't. They can't put the rules into words, but they can use them. And it's an amazing ability. Blah blah blah. I think he was just interested in this. He was like, I understand this. I can describe this with mathematical rules. Yes. So is this the, now is it the linguist that kind of combats it? Yeah. Uh, and I was thinking his political opinions are very anti-war. Do you think there's a correlation between the uh, iterations of a theory and then he become less and less pro-war? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but I think as we talk about war, he's written a book called What Kind of Creatures Are We? Where he tries to combine his political theories and his linguistic theories and his like science philosophy of science theories and to one big theory. Um, that's a great book. Difficult to read. <laughs> but yeah, I don't think he's just always been like a social anarchist. I can actually to that book there is a fun part. The first 20 pages is another guy trying to explain what's about to come. <laughs> <laughs> He's summing up the whole book before it's actually just because like this is gonna be a wild ride. Josh <laughs> <laughs> is really good at sweeping statements. As you've seen in some of the quotes, like this is how it is. And it, yes, no, it is. Yeah. How about like filler words? So words you use to like make sure understandings come across. Okay. So a lot of languages are built upon that you actually need to speak them and then when you speak them, information is lost. So the redundancy in information and languages, what would chunks can think about that? Is that not part of the like innate language you have or um insofar as it's not like structure dependent? I don't think you would say it's part of the language. Or you say like, in other words, like, you know, or mm -hmm. like that kind of thing, interaction, communication, yeah. interaction, yeah. 
I don't think you would, because it's, it's it belongs to the social domain, and it's kind of an information processing bottleneck that does that causes this. It has it's not about your language competence. So it should basically just be binary. It would be the ideal language, the best, fastest way to communicate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, there's evidence that inner speech, for example, doesn't use all these rules, that it's very it's very low effort and it actually removes a lot of filler words and a lot of, or not necessarily filler words, but all the grammatical syntax. Yeah. So uh, what is the response to that? That should be the purpose of language to be like the thing that you do. Um, yeah. I think there's a there's a difference between inner well, this hard to explain, but there's a difference between inner speech and inner language. <laughs> so, so inner speech you would have like vocalized in your head. And then and in that case you write it's kind of condensed. You don't have all these grammatical filler things or you just have the concept content. You know um, it doesn't take as long to think a sentence as it takes to say it. Um, but inner language is more like the structure of language that we need. So these merge and uh, hierarchical structure and that kind of stuff. So those are two separate things. Yeah, so it's okay. a linguistic cognition. Yeah. Okay. So I guess I get for one brief question and one brief answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just really hard for me to understand the reason that separates the behavior from, from cognition. Yeah. Um, but and I was thinking that maybe if I compare it like the decision making, because there's like normative decision making and descriptive. So can I also think about this like that? So it's like we want to do yeah. like social issues. Yeah. Like the actual yeah. Yeah. how we should do it. Yeah. And, okay. For sure. Okay, cool. We have biologists caring about muscles and arms. We have neuroscientists caring about how the brain makes the thing. Yeah. Okay, and other people need to lose to the ground, but thank you again.